Hey guys, welcome to today's episode and we have Don Klum and we are going to be talking about all kinds of things about being insulin friendly. And he's got a website called Insulin Friendly Living. And we're going to talk about how fasting can heal your body, which we already know, but it also can help to reverse insulin resistance. It can help with adrenal fatigue and exhaustion. It's going to help with menopause and hormonal balance. And so we have lots to talk to you about today. So Don, welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I appreciate the invite. So let's first start talking about insulin resistance. And I want to just mention fruit for just a second. And I I saw something that you had posted and you were talking about how, you know, everyone in their brother thinks, oh, fruit is so healthy. Let me just have fruit, 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 fruit. And in moderation it is, but we can get out of control with it. So talk about that for just a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's not necessarily about fruit. The study that I was quoting did use fruit as the in the study itself, the trial, but it's about fructose. Fructose as a food item or nutrient, if we want, or as a sugar, is is basically toxic to us mm-hmm. at this point, especially anything that's not natural, like you mentioned in a fruit. But fructose is the reason we have an addiction pathway. It's a, it's been with us for a long time and it creates a certain hormonal cascade in our body that sets us up intentionally for weight gain. So let's kind of take a couple steps backwards first and talk about how to reverse insulin resistance. So I want you to briefly talk about it. I think a lot of people know what it is, but just another reintroduction to it and how people can stabilize their blood sugar. Absolutely. Well, insulin resistance is kind of a big concept, right? It's not necessarily one thing. And so it's on a, it has like a spectrum and it ranges from Early on where you might have weight gain unexpectedly or weight loss resistance when you've gained weight and you've done the things you do before to kind of get into control and it doesn't or it gets worse. That would be weight loss resistance. Then it goes all the way through. It's what that old, that insulin resistance sets the stage for all chronic disease. So that's what prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's all build upon. They, those things can't happen unless this is first out of, out of line. So what happens is, and it's not a blood sugar problem. Blood sugars is, are what we look at to identify that something's going on. It's, it's a symptom, but it's not the problem. Because if you just if you have insulin resistance or even type 2 diabetes, and you simply lower the blood sugar, you still get all the problems. You still die earlier statistically. You still, amputations, blindness, all of that still comes. Because it's not about the blood sugar. It's about what's causing the blood sugar. Does that make sense? Yes. So... You know, I think a lot of people say all the time, you know, I just, you know, I just feel like I'm in a rut. I can't lose weight. And it's funny because almost, almost, I'd say 60 to 70% of the questions that we get in say, you know, I started fasting. I'm maybe they had 40 pounds to lose. They lost 20. They've never gained it, any of that 20 that they lost back. But then they're in this rut and they can't lose that last 20 or last 10 or last five. Whatever it is, it's like they they feel like they've they've gotten if you're if you were gonna say like from A to Z, it's like they've gotten to like letter T, right? And they just can't get the rest of that way. And that's been a question that people are having, like, what am I doing wrong? Like I've been doing the same thing, but now I'm in a rut. So I'd love for you to talk about what are the things that are holding people back from losing that last 20 pounds? Excellent. That's a great question because that happened like the plateau syndrome, right? When people make a change, they feel a change, they can see a change. And that initial weight loss is is pretty common amongst all diets. If you make a, a, a good enough change, then they hit where they slow down, what they call a plateau, and then that eventually they can go backwards. So that's a, that's a that is well documented. It happens with every diet, including the ones that we promote, if we don't manage it or know the full cycle of that thing. Right. So what ends up happening is weight loss, the initial weight loss can be 
quickly, can come quickly. And it's not as difficult as that last 20 pounds, like you're saying, but the transition there comes down to that insulin factor. You insulin as a hormone, it's a, it's a, it's a major hormone. It's primal. It's probably the, the strongest hormone we have because it basically decides whether you use energy or you store it. You can make it that simple. Forget blood sugar, forget weight gain. Insulin decides whether you're using your energy or you're storing it, period, right there. So if it's not playing nice with you, then you're going to store that energy or it'll keep you from losing it no matter what you do. That's why people go low calorie, super low calorie, or even fast at times, and they don't lose the weight that they should or they think they should because insulin won't let it go. Or if they start losing weight, they can start seeing muscle loss instead of fat. That's not a normal process. Something is off in that sense. And so it, when you get to that plateau or that time, that means insulin is still very strong. We call insulin the bully on the playground because as a hormone, because it's so primal for life, energy or not, it it's its voice is the loudest. And when it's screaming, all the other hormones freak out and they, they scatter on the playground. All of them, they all bow down to insulin. So when insulin's out, now you got insulin holding onto that fat or causing you to gain more, even though you're eating less. And you have the other hormones kind of freaking out, running around. So things like your hunger hormone, you're getting hungrier because of it. Things like your satiation hormone, you're not getting full when you eat. If you don't get full when you eat and you're hungrier, that's a combination for guaranteed overeating, waking, and, and the ball keeps rolling down that hill, right? And then the other hormone, testosterone human growth hormone, estrogen, progesterone, they all start to have problems, thyroid, adrenal, because of that, that initial fundamental disruption. So in order to get past or not have that plateau, you need to be aware of the behaviors around what stimulates insulin or magnifies its response, makes it louder, not just what's on your plate that will make it secrete in your, from your meal. Sometimes that behavior can trump your plate. That's hard for a lot of people. That's why people who are on different diets like keto, oftentimes I see online the lists and the different programs. And I say, hey, look, keto is not keto if you're not paying attention to the hidden insulin magnifiers. Because you can have, it doesn't matter what your carb count is, you can have a 300, 500, 700% increase in insulin independent of your carbs, your fats, your proteins, or any of that based on the behavior around how you, how you eat as much as what you eat. Was that, did I get? kind of clear in that? Yeah, absolutely. Hey guys, I wanted to share with you a quick bedside routine that I'm using at the moment. And I have a question for you, but listen to the end because we're going to give away some free gifts and some special offers. So if I was going to ask you what the number one health problem from all over the world, what would you say it is? Well, if you guess sleep, you'd be right. Did you know that people are complaining all the time about lack of energy? And that's the symptom. But guess what? What is the root problem? The root your problem is they're not getting enough sleep. And if you're not getting enough sleep, that's going to affect your mood, your hormones, weight gain, and so many other things. So some people, not me, I literally, I hit the the pillow and I'm like, boom, I'm going to sleep immediately. But I do have friends that say, you know, they just stare at their ceiling. They're awake for hours and hours looking at their phone. But maybe you're you're like, yes, I am getting sleep. But then when you wake up, you are literally exhausted. Well, here's what I want to suggest. I do this every night. Take a glass of water and take two natural magnesium breakthrough capsules 30 minutes before bed. This is what I love. It has seven essential forms of magnesium. And that is the key difference. Like everyone I know is in love with this product. So just so you know, they're giving away all these bonus gifts for the next thousand customers. And it's really, really awesome. They're doing like mass enzymes, their enzymes, their probiotic. And so you're going to get to try a ton of free products. So right now go to magbreakthrough.com slash waste away and you are going to get a ton of free things if you're one of the first thousand people. So go on there now. Don't forget to do magbreakthrough.com slash waste away. Get the free gifts and it's going to be amazing. I know you're going to love it. So let's talk specifics. So let's just say somebody is eating in a six hour eating window, maybe from 12 to six. And you know, 
what would you say? Okay, let's go down the checklist of things that they could be going wrong. So like, for example, saying, okay, well, how much fruit are you eating in a day? Like how much sugar are you eating? Like, let's go through the things of a checklist that they should be asking themselves to go. Because most people are like, well, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I think I'm eating pretty healthy, blah, blah, blah. So we almost need like a little checkoff. What would that be if you'd say, if you start questioning them saying, how do we take it to the next level? Sure. If you have any sign of that metabolic imbalance or struggle, you need to stay away from fructose first. <clears throat> fructose is not bad for us because of insulin. It's not bad for us because of keto, because fructose doesn't stimulate insulin. Insulin is what determines whether we use ketones or not, or we're in ketosis. Insulin is a gatekeeper for that as well. So it's not about that. It's about the way fructose is metabolized. When you consume fructose, it's metabolized in your liver almost exclusively. I mean, virtually all of it is in the liver. It's the only place that you can metabolize. It doesn't go to your lungs and your skin and your muscles. It doesn't get past the liver, right? It's a gatekeeper. And so all this comes into the liver. It has to do something with it. We call the liver Lucy, as in I love Lucy. You remember the old skits, right? That was she my favorite show when I was younger. I love that show. Well, then you'll remember the, the conveyor belt with the chocolates. Yes. Right? That, this is a perfect example. So we have Lucy the liver doing everything for everyone. We can also call her the soccer mom, right? She's just got everyone, everyone's back, but she kind of can neglect, neglect herself. So here's the chocolates coming. Here's a, here's the sugar. Mainly now we're talking about fructose coming in on the conveyor belt. No problem. It starts to speed up because we eat more of it or even just a little bit more. And you got to, and Lucy's got to handle it. So Lucy's metabolizing, 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 and then it gets overflows faster and faster and starts putting it places and where it puts it since it's not on the belt it stuffs it in his pockets her she stuffs it in her pockets under her hat remember she eats it that's what we call liver fat that's how we get fatty liver because it, it's toxic it can't go past the liver it has to do something with it and it makes liver fat right and that's how we get fatty liver and then that fatty liver causes more disruption so if you're metabolizing fructose you're not metabolizing fat It'll stop fat burning. It'll and fructose also makes you hungrier, and it makes you feel less full when you eat. Just that combination I was talking about earlier, that was very important for us when, as we evolved. Because when we had fruit, we ate a lot and we put on weight. When in the summer, right before fall, in the winter, it was part of our cycle, and that's why that is there. Fructose is two and a half times sweeter than sugar, so it's very appealing. That's why kids will always go to it. It's, it's primal. It's in their system, right? So the first thing you can do if you want a checklist, eliminate fructose. And remember that fructose metabolizing the liver, that's not going to energy. It's going to fat is it's being metabolic broken. just like alcohol. Fructose and alcohol are the same in the body. Once you consume it, there's the same pathway, same process. Everything that happens with alcohol happens with fructose, except you don't get the buzz because it doesn't get to your brain that way. Okay. So that's really important. That's why they call fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver because we used to only see it with alcoholics because they drank a lot of booze and that booze got metabolized in the liver just like this but it's the same thing so if you're worried about alcohol and you won't give it to your kids you should think the same way about fructose but so that's number one okay, okay so let me stop you real quick because let's talk about that because like i know you know like apples watermelon mango pears orange juice even honey are very high in fructose, right? Yep. So what would you say that someone would, like if, are you saying just cut fruit out altogether? Are you saying no, choose fruits that are lower in fructose or no, I'm saying what cut are it you out. suggesting? If you have a metabolic challenge, if you have metabolic syndrome, any sign of fatty liver or insulin resistance, it needs to be eliminated for a while because that will slow the progress. It's not insulin friendly to you. In time, when you change that response, it doesn't go back to normal. You have to heal that response. When you do, then you might be able to engage again. You probably can because it's a new relationship now with that food. But in that moment, if you have that injury or damage or struggle, you got to stay away from that because it'll slow your progress and it could make it worse. That's what we saw in that study I was talking about. They took a bunch of pre-diabetic people and they replaced some of the food with just fruit. And they gave them the government and recommended allowance, okay, the RDA, which is the same as the American Diabetes and the American Heart Association. Everybody recommends the same thing, two cups of chopped fruit, 
two cups of canned fruit, one half cup of dried fruit, four, four small apples. That's all one day's worth of, of fruit, okay, for the day, four servings, they say. So that's what they did. They made sure they got it and they did it for six months. All of those people, they had pre-diabetes and they had metabol- they had a fatty liver, not, but they weren't diabetic. They weren't all the way there. All, all of them saw negative reactions. They gained a significant amount of fat. They, the di- pre-diabetics developed type two diabetes. O- people developed obesity in that six months. It was all the liver markers got worse. Their blood sugar went up. Their good cholesterol went down. Their bad cholesterol went up. Everything that you wouldn't want to happen did. And it was just from eating the government recommended amount of fruit every day. Why? Because they had a challenge system like we're talking about. And they just, they gave them, they kept eating the fruit and they, most of them probably ate more than they had before. Right. And so it was just too much on the liver and it went backwards. So let's talk about more things to, to really help your liver. So you know, what, do you know any studies that have say like how many people have that non-alcoholic fatty liver? I mean, I, the last study I saw, it was like, I can't remember it, but it was astronomical. It's the number one liver condition it. and it's pro insulin resistance is the number one medical condition in the world, whether your doctor identifies it or not. It's so common because it's, it happens. It's involved in every, anyone who's overweight or obese has some level of insulin resistance, fatty liver, uh, diabetes, heart disease, dementia, cholesterol, it's all connected to that because of insulin. Insulin is involved in all of that, right? Insulin decides whether you use energy or store it. That means whether you are burning metabolically well or you're making fat. And that doesn't matter if it's cholesterol fat, if it's liver fat, or it's fat on my rear end. It's That's what insulin does. And if insulin is there, it's not coming off. So it's involved in all this. So I would say it, right now, less than 12% of Americans would be considered metabolically healthy in this sense. So if you want a number, you're looking at 88% of the Americans right now, 88% are metabolically sick. They have insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, or worse. Mm. Okay, so step one, we're gonna cut out the fruit. And then after that, we're gonna, if you wanna add some fruit back in, maybe have some tart berries, um, you know, maybe some grapefruit, something like that, that is lower in fructose once you get to the place where you can kind of sprinkle it sure. back in. Yeah, so, you just plant it out. That's, that's That makes sense. Okay, what else? What else? Okay, that's step one. You got to, because in order to heal or in order to detox, the first step is to stop retoxing. And that's what we're doing by cutting out the fruit, the high fructose corn syrup, the processed sugars. Remember, table sugars have fructose. So anything that says sugar of any kind, you got have to assume it's in there. So you got to watch out for that. The second thing is to not eat as often. Don't necessarily have to eat less at this point. Just don't, just don't eat less, eat less often. That's a big one for people. And the first thing we have people do is stop snacking. Right. When we do a financial analysis of our people, when they want to know how much they would save by doing our fasting program, they put all their numbers in the number one single expense over six months is snacks more than going out to to dinner most of the time, more than it's it's pretty significant. And so if they first if they're eating normally like the standard American, the first step would be to go to three meals a day. And then we work on removing meals and switching it up and going with the frequency, moving into uh, intermittent fasting, which. I'm old school. I don't consider that fasting and then rolling into traditional fasting. So you got to gotta build up to that because liver fat will come out fast if you do the right things. It can come out very quickly because it gets put in very quickly. It's meant for quick energy. To be honest, liver fat is normal. It's, it's a normal mechanism. It's not broken. It's not a problem. It, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, even diabetes is a normal process. We see it in other, in other animals and in, in nature. We see bears get it right before they hibernate. hibernate. They do it by eating blueberries right birds get it right before they migrate and there's some even fish that will get it before they go dormant for a season in the low feeding season why because they need that energy to do something right to sleep through the winter to make that long flight to get through the dormancy we do it for the same reason to go through a challenge the winter as well but we never go through the challenge 
We never go through the challenge. So we get prepared, but we never do the action. And so it builds up. So frequency will help with that. And these kind of actions will target that liver fat first. So if you're doing all the right things, especially in the beginning, and you're worried about that number on the scale, it's not moving. That might be because your body's trying to save your butt before it shrinks your butt right? It's working on that liver fat that has to come out first for the rest of you because all of this metabolized there. So you have to be patient and stick to it because all of a sudden it'll shift and you'll start seeing the scale change when that's cleared out. No fructose, less frequency. Once you get that down, you can move on to more advanced things. Let's talk about, well, go ahead and give us a couple more things that would be the advanced thing. Sure. The advanced that. would be you want to have a variety in your times of eating. You don't want to do the same thing every day, the same way, no matter what it is. doesn't matter if it's intermittent fasting. doesn't matter if it's three meals a day or seven. doesn't matter if it's one meal a day. <clears throat> you don't want to do the same thing because your body adapts pretty quickly and it'll start to go back backwards. It needs that change. So we have people shift their eating window, right? It might be the same six hours, but they might start earlier one day, later the next and so on working out in the morning, maybe one day in the afternoon, you start changing those things up, the body adapts faster to those. So that's important too. So change your times when you eat and don't keep it the same. The, you know, I always say sticks and stones may break my bones, but moderation will kill you, at least in, the, in our health wise. That constant steady just breaks us down. You know, it's not, we don't do well. You, we need that stimulus. So that would be the other one, shift the times. You don't make your last meal your biggest meal. I don't care what time it is. Don't if it's your biggest meal, everything gets thrown off. So that's a big one, too. So you want to make sure you have most of your food before you get to dinner and don't make it your biggest meal because that'll compound every insulin magnification. Right. And then if that meal is too late, th that's another magnifier. That's a big one. So you want to be eating before seven. You want to shift up the times of your window and you don't want your last meal to be the biggest. Does that make sense? Yeah. So let's talk about what you are eating. So I'd love to hear like <clears throat> kind of a day in the life of kind of the foods that you're eating. And, you know, are you eating grains at all? Are you eating dairy at all? Kind of what are some things that you've said? Here's some things I've just removed out of my diet. Here's some things that I sprinkle in occasionally. And but the majority of what I'm eating is this, this or this. Yeah, I, I go, I try a lot of different things. I've done everything, every diet you can imagine. I test it on myself. I test blood. I've done fasting up to 30 days. And I, I there's just, I've done a lot of things. So there's times when you're on protocol or on program and times when you're not, right? And so in general, the things that I'm looking out for, the insulin magnifiers, the highest, the most, the strongest stimulator of insulin there is, is from powders. Notice I didn't say carbs doesn't have to be a carb. It's not about the carb. The carb doesn't stimulate the insulin. The powder does. It's, it's, it's called, I call it particle size, right? In my 10 insulin, it's called, that's what we call bite size. The smaller the piece that you're eating, the bigger the insulin response. So we know about bread and flour-based products. That's why they stimulate up to seven times that much of white sugar because they were made from a powder. That's why almond flour and coconut flour, which are okay on keto lists because of the carb count, they do the same thing. They are not keto. Same thing with protein powder. 30 grams of protein in a steak, very no, limited insulin response. In a protein powder, 700% higher. Stop. That will stop your recycling and autophagy. That will stop your ketosis. That, can, that will contribute to the problem. Not because it's protein, because it's made from a powder particle size, smaller it is, higher the hyper response. This is, this is a hyper abnormal response because it's not something we've ever encountered. That's very important. So I stay away from powder-based foods. All right. That's a big one. That's number one. That's even before carbs as a, as a rule. So that, and then a day in a life, I switch my window. I will shift it around. I'll go from starting eating at 9am some days and going to sometimes one. I have a rotational fasting concept that I mix in when I'm on program. So it could be anything from one day, full day. And I do full days. People talk about 24 hours. I'm not a fan. I, we've tested it and we've monitored people. The success rate for 24 hours, like a dinner to dinner is very low because they're always thinking about the next meal or their last meal and they're waiting and they're preparing. And that's it. A full day fast is a full day. As in, I don't, I stop eating at dinner. I fast the whole next day. 
and I eat the next day at breakfast or lunch. So you really get like 40 hours if you stretch it. That's a full day plus. 24 hours is half of one day and half of another day. That's not a full day fast, right? It's two half days. So it, and it makes a difference. If you can sleep through two of those nights and get that towards your fast, that's when the magic comes out, right? That's where the hormones reset. That's where all the stuff is done when we're sleeping. And so that, that combination of the extra time and those two nights, dramatic difference from a 24 hour. So I, I incorporate those, right? If I, once a year, I do a seven day fast uh, based on Thomas Seifried's book, uh, Cancer is a Metabolic Condition. A metabolic disease. He says one seven day fast a year can eliminate 97 something percent of cancers from even forming because they, we turn on our recycling system and they get recycled out. So those are the kind of concepts that I work in depending on what time of year, where I am, you know, stress levels, activity levels and stuff like that. So I always want to be on some sort of plan. I, I don't do it day by day. I at least have my, my A and B week options, because if you don't plan, you do what shows up and that that's not, that's not successful usually. So if you can pull it off, great, but maybe in time, but you need, I believe you need to plan it all out. So that's what it looks like. I don't do, I do some dairy, not much. I like whole milk uh, if I'm going to use it and you got to be careful with creams because creams have emulsifiers. If your cream doesn't separate, there's an emulsifier and emulsifiers are major insulin magnifiers. So even your keto cream, it's going to magnify insulin, right? So that's, that's a problem. It might not be keto, even though it's on the list. So there's a lot of these things that we have to understand because the emulsifiers, just like pesticides and plastics, they hit our gut real fast and they thin the lining of the mucus, right? That's just part of the reaction they have. And that thinning is what magnifies the insulin response. Because the insulin response comes from our gut, not from our pancreas directly, not when it's in our blood. It happens well before it's in our blood. And these are some of the conceptions we have to consider if we really want to have a, a behavioral-based functional weight loss program. I want to tell you guys about a new find that I found, and it is really amazing. It's called Newtopia. We actually, if you go to our Facebook page right now, we're giving away a bunch of different free products on it. You guys have heard all about these different superpowers of mushroom extracts and collagen. And so this product has all of it. This magic in a jar is called Kala Genius. It's kind of a funny name because it's like Kala Genius, but it is genius. It's delicious. It's effective. And you simply add it to your coffee or you mix it with water. So the biggest thing that I like is that it'll refuel your brain without giving you jitters or crashes. So if you struggle with brain fog, have difficulty focusing, you might want to try it. It was just launched. Like this is literally just brand new hit the market, but go to newtopia.com slash waste away genius and use waste away 10 during the checkout and you'll save 10%. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read you a question that I read on another episode, but I'd love to hear your take on it. So I've sure. already read this question one time, but I want to read it again. Um, and this is from Misty in Burlington, Vermont. And before I answer this question, um, I want to answer, I want to say something <clears throat> because I have done some different fasts for myself. I've done three day fast. I've done five day fast. I've done seven day fast. Um, but my thyroid is I've had to increase my thyroid medicine. My thyroid is still wonky. I don't have it completely dialed in. And so when she says this, she's like, you know, I've heard you do a three-day fast. I've heard you do a seven-day fast, which is true. But I do want to say to her that honestly, I'm in a place right now, and I don't know if it's my hormones, I don't know what it is, is that yes, I was able to do these longer fasts, for me personally, and I'm almost positive that the reason is because of my thyroid medicine, I'm not able to do as long of a fast because then it makes me kind of feel sick because the, th you know, it's kind of like your thyroid goes on overdrive when you are, um, 
you know, fasting. So I'll read this to you. She says, I've heard on your podcast about you personally doing a three-day fast or seven-day fast. I've lost 20 pounds after reading Waste Away and listening to your book every week. Your book, One Meal and a Tasting, is my favorite. I wish you had that book on audiobook, which I do have an audiobook. I don't know why she's saying that, but she said, I wish you had an audiobook, which we do. Um, She said, I still have about 15 pounds to go. I absolutely can't go past 20 hours on a fast. And then I just have a meltdown. I am on thyroid medicine and I think my thyroid just goes nuts and I feel terrible. I've heard about the fasting mimicking diet, but I'm very anti-packaged food. I don't eat one thing that's in a package. I eat very clean. I eat fruit, vegetables, and lean meats. I eat a paleo diet with almost everything I eat is organic. If someone was going to do a fasting mimicking diet, I want to do a DIY, but I think she means DIY version where maybe I could lose the weight. So, and she has a few other things, but that's the gist of it. So um, how would you respond to that? Well, there's a lot of ground you covered in that question, right? For sure. And we can address it. The thing was to start with thyroid medicine. Certain thyroid, most thyroid medicines, they have a weird response in the body with insulin receptors. They can, the body will actually grow more receptors. It can triple the amount of insulin receptors we have in our body as a reaction to the medication. The trifecta of hormonal disruption is insulin, cortisol, stress, and thyroid. Those three, those three get together and that's that's what the major center of it all is. So you're right in thinking that, but the medicine itself will magnify the receptors. Therefore, will take up more, will listen to insulin closer and, you know, it can cause, it can keep you from losing weight. You get a, you get a response, an abnormal response. That can be an issue. It's not about the metabolism. The, the metabolism doesn't change day by day due to medication or anything else. Uh, so even exercise or eating or not eating activity or not, act, it, it's pretty well said it's a budget, right? But over time it can, but not day by day. So that's the first thing. So that is a consideration. We do much more. You have to look at that a little bit more specifically. And then if you can't get through 20 to hours, then you probably weren't ready to do it. We do a lot of, there's four phases of a complete fasting cycle, the prep and planning, the support, the fast itself. And the reinforcement at the after. So it's before, during, and after. And if you don't plan the whole thing, it's not a complete cycle. And you won't get what you're thinking out of it. Just because you don't eat for 24 hours doesn't mean you get what's on those posters that say it is there. It's, it's not true. Just like get 10 people randomly and have them do the same workout. It's not going to be the same. And they're not going to get the same thing out of it, even though it's the same workout, right? So you got it. You want to prepare. You want to support yourself. And you want to... the soon with the refeeding is the most important part it's not the fast nothing nothing builds during the fast the fast is about programming the body to get ready to regenerate it's cleaning things up it's signaling what needs to go where it's going around and doing inventory and and, and recycling pieces that have been left around and then when that food comes in if it's got the right hormonal profile we don't go break a fast with chicken wings beer and a pizza right? Then it takes those raw materials and does what was it was told during the fast. Does that make sense? Because we have to replace those things we're recycling. And that's where the stem cells come out. And the stem cells have to then go to their places. They're like new workers out of college, all excited. They're brand new. They got a whole new thing and they go to the new workspace. It's got to be a, a conducive environment. If it's a hostile work environment, they leave. They're very sensitive, but we want them to have tenure and stay around for, for the for the duration. So it's got to be the right environment. If not, we recycle all of the stem cells that we just created and worked hard to do. That's a problem. That's a problem. So you got to maintain these things all the way through the complete cycle. You do that, then they'll stick. They stick, then they'll start to incorporate. And that's what we call regeneration. That's what healing is. Cells don't repair. They die. New ones come. If the new ones are better than the old ones, it's an improvement. It's called healing. Right. That's very important. So we're not. And when we're fasting, it goes around and it checks on all the cells and says, hey, cell, you're past your retirement age. What are you doing here? You should be out on having a Mai Tai. And so basically resets those retirement clocks so that when we refeed, we can replace them. And then they they leave happily because cells, when they're stressed out, they don't work as well and they don't work as well. That clock gets off and they stay on their job too long when they should because the apoptosis is the cell's 
time clock to tell it when it's supposed to recycle or die. And they don't. And that's part of the problem. So all this has to happen. And it takes all those four phases in it. So I would say medication, you got to consult with someone who knows what they're talking about to deal with that. And you also have to plan out the whole fast, not just not eat, right? That's not what a fast is. You got to plan before, during, and after. Okay. And, and you do that well, because if you don't feel good when you fast, like, especially that quickly, it's not, it's usually either a detox reaction, a withdrawal symptom, or sometimes it's like boredom and other things that can kick in that distract us and we get hyper-focused, but it's not true hunger, right? It's not, it's, your body's not weak. You don't go drop energy. You're not, you don't, you always have the same amount of energy. So you, the sensation you're feeling is from one of those things is not from the fast. Sometimes it can be electrolytes too, especially if you didn't, the part of the prep, you didn't load your stores before you went into that fast. Does that make sense? Is that too much? Or I, I No, I, I love that. And I love that what you said, that the cells don't repair. You want them to die and you want new ones to rebuild. And the the best way for cells to die is to fast and you want to regenerate new ones. Like, I think that's really powerful the way that you said that. And well, you know, that seven true. day fast from Safe Read, the reason he said that it prevents the cancers from forming is cancers make tumors, right? Do you ever wonder how, where, what they make them from? Cancer forms and makes its fortress, it makes a tumor from our junkyards. It's not from something outside of us. They don't do it by themselves. They take up the pieces that should have been recycled. Think of your house. If you don't take out the garbage for a week, it builds up everywhere, right? Stacks up here, stacks up there. That's happening in the body and the cancer cells start to get a little bit wonky and they just use that junk and they build their fortress. That's where it comes from. It's called biomass. And it happens when we don't get into the recycling system, which is because we're in the fed state constantly. We eat all day long, every day, and we never get out of that state. It just builds up. We never take out the garbage because the garbage gets taken out. Your body recycles when you're not eating in the repair state. Fed, fasted the fasted states repair the fed state is not right and so by cleaning that out on a regular basis cancer can't grow there's nothing they can't there's nothing to build so they they don't form at all when when they don't have the materials they can't form out of nothing so that's why that's talking about you have to go through that so that's just wanted to touch on that because you mentioned it and that's when the cell death happens that's when the recycling the pieces that are broken get taken out and we get the upgrades so when you get those cells after a fast if you do it right that's a that's an upgrade right even if your number and the scale doesn't change you're you just got better muscle cells you just got better heart cells live that's why people look better when they fast i can look back at pictures over the years and i can tell you exactly when i was fasting and when I wasn't, right? Because you can, it's just, there's a look to it. It's because of that, right? And so you, you want them to stick around and get that old stuff out. Talk a little bit more about that with that study that the guy did where he talked about the seven days. And if you fast for seven days, you can help not have cancer because of it. Yeah, well, it's the same concept. When we're eating all the time, insulin is always there. We're always in storage mode. We're not in elimination. When we eat, we're in breakdown mode, right? Because you got to think of chewing. You're breaking down the food in your stomach. You're breaking down the food in your intestines. You're breaking down the food. It's going into your body and doing what it does. Your whole body is in breakdown mode. You break down more protein, muscle, and tissue when you're in the fed state eating than you do when you're not eating when you're fasting. So when people say, oh, you're going to eat your muscle and all that, they don't, it's, it's not how, it's not what happens. You actually break down more tissue while eating because you're in breakdown mode. When you don't have food coming in, the body says, well, okay, there's no food coming in. Stop the breakdown and turn on the recycling. We got to keep what we got. And so it, that's what the shift in hormones, insulin goes down, growth hormone goes up, the things shift around and we go into the recycling mode. We use what we have instead of keep breaking things down, right? So that, that's an important, very important one. So when we need to get in that state, because because once the breakdown stops and we start to retain and recycle, that's what picks up pieces of cells and cells that are not working right. Those older cells, cells that are kind of They've mutated, they get picked up and they get flagged and they get taken out. Those cells, if given the opportunity, can become the cancer. But if they're eliminated 
early, they don't have a chance to. That's how you prevent them from forming. You see what I'm saying? You don't you, you don't give them any junk. You don't give them any materials. You cut off their supplies like in a war. You want to you starve their their troops. They can't do anything. It never starts. So let's talk about menopause for just a second. And what do you feel like would be the best tips for intermittent fasting to help with menopause weight gain? Well, remember a lot of this, and I, I'm not always popular talking about this, so please be nice to me. Uh, the menopause doesn't have to be a big problem. A lot of places in the world, it's not, it's not a pathology. It's not a health condition. Some places have barely have any words for what goes on during menopause because they don't experience it like we do. What sets the stage for strong menopause symptoms and problems during menopause, including weight gain, isn't just the hormone shift because that, that happens. That doesn't, that's not, doesn't add up. It's the same condition that makes for very strong and bad periods in PMS. The same one that caught causes endometriosis and fibroids, the same one that causes PCOS, and that's insulin resistance. If you're insulin resistant, as you get into that phase, when those hormones start to shift, everything is magnified. So if you're there or before you get there, peri or even before, if you're insulin sensitive, insulin friendly, and you got a good balance there, you won't experience those extreme conditions. You just, it doesn't. When in my program, I started working. I did a podcast with uh, Mindy Pell. She's uh, in fasting. She's a friend of mine. She's going to my seminars for a long time. Seminars I speak at and things like that. And great. And we talked She's about been it. on our podcast at least two times, maybe, uh, three, I think. Oh, yeah. What energy, yeah. right? What energy. Great. Fantastic. So I mean, we were talking about it and I kind of took a second. I just talked about menopause and the things that they do to prepare to fast because they're in that condition or that stage of life. And I really got a little nervous because I thought about it and I've worked with thousands of people on the population level, hundreds of people one-on-one. -on -one, and I thought I, we don't do anything. We've never done anything. And we've never had reports of a problem doing it that way. And I thought, wait a minute, if they have to do all these different things to prepare to fast differently, what am I missing? And I went back and I, I pulled a lot of my old clients and I talked to them and they, some of them had problems before it, but it cleared up. Well, a couple of them had like very problems before, during, and after they still do. It's just part of their, their own person, their, their own experience. Right. I don't know, but most people had a significant improvement and we didn't see a lot of the inability to fast because of it. And I think that's because we did the prep, the planning and, and all the four phases. And we did it over my program is 25 weeks. There's a reason why it's six months and not six days or six weeks. Right. And so if you plan it and take your time and honor and respect those different phases, it's way more comfortable than people think. First of all, people who would guarantee me they couldn't fast. I mean, they would bet their house, especially the husbands, you know, they're just, they just, they think I'm crazy. And then they get past that point of the program. And afterwards, they're like saying, hmm, I don't want to eat again. Do I have to eat again? And I'm going, who is this person? Right. It's a big shift. So if you do it right, it's I'm never going to say it's easy. Right. That would be overshoot. But it's way more comfortable. And it, you don't hear the horror stories. And we didn't. So if you do it well, you can totally you don't have to do all these special extra things. You can do it right and and take your time and it, that's what will help you through it mm, i love that let's talk for just a second about um what you think is the best way for someone who let's say they right now are in a lull and you say okay they're just down and out they're in the dumps give us like your like three steps to kind of get themselves back on track that happens all the time you know these last couple of years have been very stressful right i mean people have gone through things they never expected so i understand that and we've in my salt in my program i saw it in my life so i get that so first of all no shame right don't beat yourself up it doesn't matter what got you here you're here let's go forward that's the first thing that that plays a big role. So give yourself some grace. Okay. First and foremost, it's all right. doesn't matter. As you move forward, the first thing you do is you just go, you get back to the basics. Don't look to do a big program. That's got these extravagant concepts or supplements or whatever, because 
you're not if you're not doing the basics everyday lifestyle changes there's nothing to build upon you can't get much from those things later down the line so what i'm talking about is three meals a day clean up the diet get moving even if it's just walking do some breathing spend some time alone make sure you're doing that every day and celebrate those little changes cuz that's what will allow the big changes to happen they don't happen anywhere anywhere else so that's what i would say the first thing to do get back to the basics second thing decrease the frequency right third thing stop the powders of any kind okay awesome tell us about what your opinion is with parasites we had a guest that just came on and i really agree with him he said that he feels like you know the root cause of a lot of these diseases with thyroid and autoimmune and all of it is parasites and it's causing all these health problems. And he's like, no one's talking about it. Even the functional medicine doctors aren't really bringing up what a big deal this is. Uh, what is your opinion on that? And do you do, do you talk about it at all in your program? Yeah, we have to talk about all of that. And none of, I, I do not adhere to the, germ theory of the cause of disease. It's a secondary. The body has to be susceptible for any germ or parasite, bacteria, virus to be able to take hold and cause an illness. It's not it, it, just because you're in contact with a virus, a, a bacteria or a parasite or have it in you even doesn't mean you're going to be sick or it's causing a problem. But if your system runs down, then it has a chance. It's like a race. And as long as you're two steps ahead of these things, you're fine. But as soon as we slow down, they can kick in. They're opportunists. So the first thing I think of is if you keep that strength up, you keep your body working optimally. That's why I don't think you can't boost your immune system. You can't, you know, reset your hormones. You don't have to, you have to allow them to operate optimally. If we don't have to help them, we need to get out of their way. We get them working optimally. That's what people call a boost because they're living their life suboptimal in their expression of health. If you have a good inspection of health, you don't. But that being said, when things are run down, yes, there are parasites that, that definitely cause a lot of damage in, in, in their metabolites. And, and there's a lot just in the liver and the intestines. There's something like two pounds or two to four pounds in the average person all the time. If you don't keep them tame, the worst, for example, the worst bacteria in the world that would kill more humans is not Ebola in Africa. It's not in a bee or somewhere flying around. It's in your gut right now. And if it gets unhappy and it turns on you, that's when things go bad real fast. So it's about keeping the symbiosis, keeping things balanced, keeping things in optimal health. And then that's 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 the thing. When they're out of whack, that's when these opportunists come. You can get a, that's why people are run down. They can get a cold after a cold after a cold. A head cold turns into a chest cold turns into pneumonia. You know, it's just it just the opportunists show up. Keep everything strong. And they can't go. So that, so but parasites do play a role in that. But within those uh, within those pathogens, um, par parasites are pretty significant. And I have worked with them. Now, if someone, if I'm pretty clear, that's what's going on. I know who to send them to because that takes a very specific approach. And uh, it's not me. But usually we don't. It's not not too often we have to deal with it because if you do the basics, you get on track. The body knows how to do it. But when it can't, it needs help. Awesome. Well, this has been great, Don. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Yeah, they can find me on Facebook is a great one. Uh, you can find my personal page. I post every day. I put I put my thoughts and I have over 600 original articles on all things insulin videos and all that. And I also have and it's called Don Clum, just my name, Don Clum, uh, Facebook or my group Insulin Friendly Fasting Secrets. You can join that as well. And that's where my archives are for Facebook. I've over a thousand posts and graphics and videos and podcast recordings and all that. If you want to go to my website, it's insulinfriendlyliving.com. There's questionnaires on there that are free, no barrier of entry opportunities to see how your thyroid's doing. If you have weight loss resistance, insulin resistance, adrenal fatigue, irritable male syndrome for men. If men, if you think you're not hormonal, yeah, think again, you're more hormonal than your woman, but we can, that's a whole nother podcast and the, the nine testosterone cycles. So you can, you can, you can take those and you can see your score free and then decide. So just, I want to have the best free offerings online in my little industry out there, no barrier of entry, no upsell. So go on there, check it out, do the savings calculator, have at it. Insulinfriendlyliving.com. Insulinfriendlyliving.com. Mm -hmm. 
So what we want to do if it, with your audience is we want to make a special meal plan recipe book concept just for people going into near in or just after menopause. This is just for menopause. We'll do a custom book that is a meal plan, seven days, at least two different kinds of eating. So it might be, might be insulin friendly. Like I do, it might be plant-based or it could be paleo. We'll have different options, a full week of each. And you can go in there and you can, you can, use those recipes. There'll be education materials. You can learn some more and you can be more confident as you go through this part of life. And we'll put the link in the show notes. Perfect. Sounds good. Love it. Well, you guys stay tuned. We've got another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now.